Okay, first and foremost, I need to apologize uh, for any background noise that you might hear. Um, it's really loud in my room, but that doesn't matter. We're just going to keep going on as if you can't hear um, anything that's going on. Uh, I, I really like this world, by the way. Uh, it's very relaxing, and there's like crickets chirping and all of that. Um, and it's very strange how um, I would come on to VR chat and I would actually uh, put in earplugs uh, and then have my earphones on top of that um, so that I'm basically like blocking out sound outside of me and then I get to uh, turn up the volume a lot more um, so that uh, it it sounds like a very strange thing to do to, for the sake of immersion but um, there's just a lot of really annoying sound um, in my in, in my day-to-day -day living situation um, even to the point where uh, I, I do some work at a library like when I have the time that seems something very appropriate oh I need a quiet place to write for my books or right now I'm editing uh, a book um, and I, I feel very passionate getting back into editing because I've put things off for a while um, and now I'm dedicating more time back to that instead of being very technical in my focus um, and that was something which took a conversation for me to realize it took someone actually like taking me aside in you know you, you catch up with friends and just talking about little things here and there uh, but then there's something that breaks the pattern where they say you know this is this is serious when someone brings to mind, when someone that you're interacting with uh, brings to mind, look, this stands out as something important in need of discussion, that's, very, that's a very good thing, especially when you yourself don't have proper perspective on the item in question. So I'm being very vague here, but the first principle that I need to talk about here is expenditures. When it comes to motivational speaking and all these feel-good talks that people give about oh you need to try your best and just go after it and you miss a hundred percent of the shots that you take they don't realize that every try um, has an expenditure behind it so I see this happening with uh, and, and this is like our main topic that we're getting into here I, I see this happen a lot with language learning where people want to give up if it's not immediately satisfying. If, if someone's doing something like language learning, this is a great example for this larger concept because you're not going to be making money from language learning. And even if you are going into developing fluency to the highest degree possible in order to become a translator or something like that, uh, you're much better off learning how to do welding or something because that's legitimately more profitable for the amount of time that you put into cultivating the skill. Um, 500 hours in learning how to weld is going to uh, earn you a great deal more career advancement and um, 500 hours of welding is much more profitable than 500 hours of learning Spanish. So, most people are learning languages not for a professional reason, but for personal reasons. They, they want to develop themselves in some manner, and that is a noble goal to have. However, there is a cost to trying to learn a, another language. There's also just this mental energy that drains you to use another language for a very, very long time. I mean, even people that have been fluent for years and years in speaking English as a second language when they're having a conversation for a while using their non-native language it exhausts them in a way that uh, when they switch back to their native language they feel like ah, a sense of relief and a sense of understanding and I think that if you haven't had that experience yourself of like just how is it mentally exhausting to translate things over where and how do you, it like suppresses expression in a way where you're not able to naturally let things flow. You're not able to get into a flow state um, with a language that's not your own. I think, man, if I could define fluency and if we had very operant ways of measuring a flow state and uh, correlate that to um, how you were able to express yourself in another language, maybe that's how I would uh, 
define fluency uh, in this sort of uh, mental cognitive fashion. But uh, broadly speaking, very generally, um, when you're doing something that you are not familiar with, um, you are not able to get into a flow state and you won't be able to for a very long time until you've developed a certain level of mastery. Um, and so there's a lot of trials and tribulations you have to go through in order to develop that sense of mastery. When you're doing something that's not profitable, uh, you have to ask, well, what is the benefit to this? Yes, it's a matter of self-development uh, to like learn a foreign language or to do art. There's many pursuits that people want to get into. Learning an instrument, that's another good one uh, in this genre. Uh, or writing, actually, that's going to be another topic that we'll bring up here. There are things that take a great deal of time, a great deal of effort. Uh, in order for it to be worthwhile, uh, there must be something that, at the very minimum, replenishes the resources lost in uh, the course of trying. Like, if I have a day job, very simple example. If I have a day job working at a fast food restaurant, and that's how I make ends meet, somehow I'm able to make ends meet uh, by living in a trailer and working at a fast food restaurant. There we go. There's our scenario. Um, but I have a passion for learning languages. Let's just use Spanish as an example here. Uh, day to day, uh, I, have, I have my simple job duties. I flip burgers during the day and by night I study Spanish. Uh, I want to improve myself. I have a strong connection to the language. Uh, I feel very strongly towards it. But if I am like exhausted, if I'm just super tired from uh, giving my all towards my job, as simple as it might be, flipping burgers, and then I'm uh, exhausted from, in the evening, I'm not recovering, I'm not feeling invigorated from rest in the evening, I'm just tiring myself out even more with studying Spanish, then it takes some kind of like feedback to really drive home, to really like hammer that nail home of, yes, an expenditure is going on. It's not just, oh, you feel a little bit tired, so toughen up buttercup. And I am, I am very close to doing very bad things to any individual who, in response to me saying something sincere and giving a sincere concern uh, about like some aspect of suffering that one must endure, if they say, oh, just toughen up buttercup or suck it up, something like that, that's a very reprehensible individual that does not have a recognition of humanity inside them. They should be treated accordingly. I hate certain phrases. Certain phrases give you an insight into the mindset that another individual has, especially if there are these sort of thoughtless phrases that are repeated over and over again. Um, like, oh, just toughen up, buttercup. If someone expresses vulnerability towards you, they are trying to engage in trust. If you respond by stepping on them, oh, just toughen up, buttercup. Oh, I don't care about you. I don't care about what you say. Oh, things are rough. I'm not going to listen to your situation. You are crying out for empathy, and I shall not give you so much as a drop. That's disgusting. It's an absolutely... I, it's absolutely reprehensible, but it, especially in an individualistic society where people have no sense of obligation to one another, uh, that sort of situation is going to happen a lot, especially if those other people are already pushed to their limit where they don't have anything to give in turn. They are exhausted. They're like, oh yeah, everyone's tired. Everyone's struggling with this. That doesn't justify the ubiquitous suffering going on around, yet from the individual perspective, they don't have they have run out of F's to give, uh, to be PG in my phrasing here. So in instead of looking at this empathetic example, which is another example of how when someone is out of mental juice, then they are not going to uh, be behaving in a civilized manner, so to speak. If I am trying to, if I'm trying to learn Spanish, um, and the effort that I put into it uh, exceeds the sense of like liveliness and fulfillment that I get out of it, um, then it takes real world consequences to drive home that gap. And over enough of a time scale, that will make itself apparent. The first thing that is a signal of problems occurring with some sort of imbalance. There is some sort of imbalance if there's an expenditure that exceeds the 
uh, the profit that one gains. And I, I don't mean to strictly put things into economic terms. When you like operationalize, how does this whole mental framework of being a human being and managing mental health, um, how does this work? Looking at things in terms of uh, a more mechanical way, like doing a cost-benefit analysis, but towards things on an emotional level. You're not just feeling tired. That's the first signal, is that you feel that something is wrong. Um, and this is actually like the zeroth signal. This is like when you're when you're proving uh, like a mathematical postulate or something like that. Uh, you have certain things that, um, in order to even like set the groundwork for the formula at hand, you have to take for granted this. Whenever you start a new activity, whenever you have this new undertaking, let's say that I haven't studied any Spanish before, uh, and it's my first week of doing Spanish, I am necessarily going to feel doubt, and that that's good in a sense. Um, because it makes you question. It was, I don't even know if it... Putting a moral value judgment on it is a little bit confusing because it's not good or bad, it's necessary. What do you put into something? What do you get out of it? Um, especially if it's something that is like done for the long term, so you have to consider how sustainable the activity is. If uh, you are constantly burning a whole lot of fuel and nothing's getting put back into the tank, then you're going to be... Um, you're going to be left high and dry pretty soon. You start something new, you're going to feel doubt about it, and that compels you to do a cost-benefit analysis of, well, what do I get out of this? Absolutely, every action that we take part in, especially if it's something that's repeated and something that we consistently do for a, a long period of time, there has to be some kind of motivation to it. And if you say that, oh, there's just, I just feel like doing it or something like that, and then you're just obfuscating the actual motivations, which absolutely we can have irrational motivations. That's something that occurs, uh, as well as we can have intangible motivation, something that is emotionally rewarding or something that is socially rewarding. And I would argue that a great deal of motivation is social, absolutely. Um, I will argue against the concept that you need to personally feel like in your heart of hearts that you love studying Spanish. But if everyone around you is like, so um, uh, in where I live, uh, a lot of people do use Spanish. So someone would go, oh yeah, that makes sense. There's some Spanish speakers around so that it makes sense to learn that language. But if I were to say something like, I want to learn Hungarian, uh, which is if you know anything about linguistics, it is a complete factor more complicated than Spanish if you're starting from English, the language that I am using, of course. Um, then, and there's no Hungarian speakers around. Then it's very reasonable for uh, your friends, your acquaintances, your family to say, why are you doing this? You're spending a lot of effort towards something where you're not going to be able to use this language, you're not going to be able to relate to people in this language, what is the motivation? With this example of studying Hungarian, you cannot relate to anyone who has um, the same endeavor. I'm studying Hungarian. I do not have anyone around me who is studying Hungarian. Why would I continue in that motivation? So you'd have, it, that's a very clear example of, you have a personal drive, whatever it might be. Let's say that, um, I idealize Hungarian culture because I've read some of their classical literature um, and it, it moved my very soul beyond any other stories that I have that I had ever read in my life. So let's say I have a very personal, almost spiritual experience, which even then I would say that um, these like subjective cultural experiences are subordinate to, um, to like kinship connections. Like if I were Hungarian, let's say that my ancestry is Hungarian, but uh, one or two generations of immigrants back, uh, like I, I went to another culture and then I'd never experienced my home culture and I only know this uh, cultural aspect as um, a, a disconnected member of a diaspora. Uh, that, that drive to connect back where it's like, 
part of your blood, part of your kin. That is, that's a more abstract concept, but that is very social in nature of wanting to connect to others. And that's, and that, that makes more sense. Of course, it's like family is more important than strangers. Um, so if I have Hungarian family, then studying Hungarian is much more important to me. Um, if, especially if I have a vision in the future of, of integrating into that culture, or at least experiencing that culture in a significant way. I don't have to become a Hungarian citizen. Even then, that, that whole issue of the diaspora, um, of, and that applies to various cultures, uh, the diaspora is a very um, difficult situation. If there's a diaspora of Hungarian immigrants in America, then that group of immigrants has a completely different experience of what the culture is, what Hungarian culture is, as opposed to people who have lived in Hungary for all of their lives. This is a very odd sort of situation to explain because most people do not understand these like abstracts discussions of cultural interplay that they have not personally experienced themselves. And I find this very saddening that um, explaining experiences uh, often falls uh, upon deaf ears, and I struggle to use that uh, phrase because I do have a lot of deaf friends. Um, oddities with me thinking about exceptions and caveats too much. Regardless, uh, people don't, t even if you have something very meaningful to say about a very unique experience, like me talking about you know connecting to a diaspora is nothing like connecting to the homeland, but that concept of a homeland is very disconnected from a lot of people um, where they can't, or even just the idea of having a sense of pride in who you are has uh, significantly been perverted um, in recent years and the like, where you're only allowed to have pride in certain things. Um, and these things are like taken for granted that you can't challenge them, and that limits people's view of themselves, and that limits people's view of acceptability and the like. Well, acceptability is socially driven. That's a larger thing that I'm getting at here. But um, people are not able to uh, relate to these things they have not personally experienced them so that really limits the capability of like having this discussion reach a lot of people it's really not going to um, especially when you have to engage in these uh, mental exercises and part of it it's it's very much like a physical exercise where if you have not worked out that muscle in uh, in quite a while then you're not going to be able to lift up the barbell so well do an upright rose with my imaginary barbell here um where and i guess i am calling people weak-minded in and that's being frank about it but uh i mean behaviorally not being able to engage in important serious intellectual discussion um is a weakness not being able to do that absolutely is a weakness and i'm sick of pretending like it's not in certain contexts, we want to protect others from their inadequacies uh, when how you get over inadequacies is you improve yourself. And then the difficult thing is, well then, how do we have a coherent structure by which someone can improve themselves and gain that strength and gain that capability and develop into a better person? And so, like, with, with talking about abstract things here and talking about experiences, engaging in the conversation is the exercise itself. So I, I apologize for getting a, a bit meta there, um, but I, I want to go back to the concept of, uh, of motivations and uh, how we are socially driven towards uh, like maintaining motivation and things, where uh, if I have, like when I was studying German, um, I had a group of online friends that were very supportive. It was enjoyable. It was inherently rewarding for me to speak German, for me to uh, try and translate things back and forth when they were speaking English, to try and like relate things back to German. Just interacting was an enlivening experience because of the sense of community that we had and because of the sense of a unified goal that we shared with each other. Basically, um, well, also there's uh, a, a sense of cultural coherence uh, because it's everyone of European ancestry and very similar European ancestry at that. 
um, where there's certain matters of decorum and decency that go unsaid and that when you have uh, when you have decent people in a group it's easier to have a decent interaction this was also a small close-knit group so we didn't have we didn't have to deal with like you know the, the whole mass appeal thing is you're not trying to um you're not trying to make a profit you're not trying to appeal to people's emotions or anything like that but it was like a very informal naturally occurring thing of oh hey i have another friend who's interested in learning english uh, and he speaks german so we'll we'll invite him if he has time for this time slot or that uh, oh this person's also interested in german the issue there is that um when just things kind of like drift together it's very easy to also drift apart and that eventually did happen but for the time being when it was active um th there was this nice group of people where just sharing experiences with one another um was inherently rewarding and that is something that is important to notice that being able to freely express yourself around people who are receptive to that expression is socially rewarding. That is, um, it's not camaraderie, it's not a, a being a confidant. That's what being a confidant is about, um, is accepting what others are saying, being able to accept um, those expressions that others give. Um, and that's a very important part of mental health overall is having people uh, in whom you can confide that requires you to that requires this uh, i feel very odd saying so it requires you to uh, trust them and to enjoy their company and uh, to not censor yourself and that's a very odd situation when you're using a, another language because your expression will always be limited when using a language other than your own you're not able to get to a certain flow state and one thing that really justifies a heavy amount of effort towards something, uh, especially as you develop mastery towards it, is getting into that flow state, which does give this sense of vigor. Um, not necessarily in the, the moment, it does give a sense of vigor, um, but I should say that um, it is very much like burning the candle at both ends when you are regularly getting into a flow state because it's very easy to burn out when you're giving a great deal of effort. Again, we come back to the issue of how does one recover from these expenditures? And what I'm getting at with talking about these social motivations um, is that having those connections, being around people who care about you, when you are around friends where the overall feeling that you get from being around them um, is like relaxing, is belonging, then that's something that, that really replenishes the soul. It, it is something, like belonging is something that you must feel like you're surrounded by acceptance in order for it to like really take effect. Well, I mean, let's do a comparison to a, a city that has, uh, let, let, let's, let's do a very fantasy-like comparison where you have a, a medieval city where you need to have walls around it because there's goblins out there. There's goblins and monsters that will attack the city um, if you don't have these walls. So you have the moat that goes around it and you have these defenses um, so that you keep the town safe uh, within those walls. You, the, the town has a feeling of safety because of this complete encirclement. There's a zone that is safe because of these walls that have been built, these structures that are protective, that you can feel safe within. Um, but if there is, uh, you know, not even an entire wall coming down, if the gate is crashed uh, and there's a hole punched through one of the walls where now the goblins can come pouring in, then there's no feeling of safety. The, the entire village could be sacked from one breach. In a similar way, um, if you have a breach of trust within a social group, um, then uh, the metaphorical goblins come slipping in where then there's distrust, there is doubt, uh, there's a great deal of frustration going on. Um, and that is how uh, social capital is a very delicate thing that can collapse very easily when you do not hold 
everyone within that social group to very high standards. Uh, because you need to have those high standards of trust in order to make sure that those walls remain intact. That sounds strenuous and the like, but uh, it's really coming down to like, be a nice guy. And if you're not nice, then uh, we don't want you. Uh, we don't want you here because you don't know how to play nice with the other kids, and you can only be as nice as the meanest person in the room. And I hate to put things in like childish, infantilizing terms, but the vast majority of humanity, it appears, operates on the level of mental children. So it's necessary to break things down into uh, very understandable. Um, demonstrations and explanations like 